right. Uh, good afternoon or good morning to everyone who's joining us today for our webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Expanding Quality Improvement, Establishing Measures and Data Collection for Diabetes Screening and Management. Uh, next slide. If this is your first time joining us, my name is Andrew Phillip. I'm a uh, senior director here at the National at the <laughs> Primary Care Development Corporation. Uh, and this is part of our larger project uh, in partnership with the National Council for Behavioral Health and the SAMHSA Center of Excellence for Integrated Health Solutions. Uh, next slide. And if you're not familiar with us, uh, Primary Care Development Corporation is a national nonprofit uh, dedicated to enhancing excellence in primary care and equity through advocacy, uh, capital investment, and through uh, practice transformation, through coaching, consultation, and a host of other methods. Next slide. As we mentioned, we're, uh, this initiative is sponsored by SAMHSA, and it's important to note that the views, opinions, and content expressed in today's webinar uh, do not necessarily reflect their views, um, those of the Center for Mental Health Services, uh, Health and Human Services, or any other federal or government agency. Next slide. So this is, uh, you know, as many of you know, this is part of a broader series, and all of these seven parts of this year-long series have really been looking at how can we take a more integrated approach, particularly between primary care and behavioral health to addressing the needs of our patients and clients who have or are at risk for diabetes? How we're proposing to do that is through working with teams to really maximize the, their effectiveness. Uh, if you don't have a team at your disposal or some of the specialists we've talked about, uh, how do you enhance the people who are there and the processes that are already there? And then how do you take those processes and really make them even more efficient, even more effective? And that will be a big focus of what we talk about today. Next slide. Again, this is part of our series. Uh, after today, you'll have also uh, coming up later this month, operational and clinical pathways. And then finally, uh, in July, we'll have a discussion around incorporating the expertise of people with lived experience in the area of diabetes, primary care, and behavioral health. Next slide. Um, so very, very briefly, just a reminder, why are we talking about this? Well, we know that uh, individuals who uh, have diabetes are also at disproportionately higher risk for also having uh, chronic behavioral health conditions, things like depression, anxiety, and others. But also on the flip side of that, our patients who have uh, mental health conditions are much more likely to not only have diabetes, but also suffer worse consequences and ultimately outcomes related to diabetes. So whether you're coming in from primary care or behavioral health, we know that there's opportunities for our patients in this area. Uh, next slide. So I'm excited to introduce our presenters today. Uh, uh, Maya Morse and Amy Goodman are both senior project managers here at the Primary Care Development Corporation. Uh, Maya is an expert coach and facilitator for a patient-centered medical home uh, transformation work. Currently, she leads our billing and coding program and also provides coaching and facilitation related to access to quality improvement and to the patient-centered medical home overall. Uh, just prior to joining PCTC, Maya worked as a site manager at Norwalk Community Health Center, where she managed daily operations and also provided departmental oversight through that entire center. Uh, joining her is Amy Goodman, who has worked for over 20 years in nonprofit healthcare. Here at PCDC, as a patient-centered medical home content expert, she's led transformation and quality improvement projects across the country. Uh, and as she develops these tools for patient-centered medical home training, also with analyzing client practice workflows, policies, data, and also advising practices on opportunities for improvement overall, which she'll be bringing into today's discussion. Amy has extensive experience working in the intellectual and developmental disabilities field as a behavioral health clinician, uh, and also as a multi-specialty site practice manager. Um, so I'll turn it over to Amy and Maya in just a moment. Just a reminder, uh, you have access to your chat uh, and, and uh, to submit any questions. Uh, and we'll be taking questions at the end here, but feel free to submit them throughout. We'll also be posting recordings of today's session, including the slides up at uh, pcdc.org slash resources, as well as at the nationalcouncil.org slash integrated dash health dash C-O-E. And we'll post those into the chat for you as well. So uh, Maya and Amy, thank you for joining us and I'll turn it over to you both. Hi everybody, welcome to our webinar. I'm so glad we could be here today. I'm Maya Morse uh, and I'm gonna kick us off with some learning objectives. 
So first, we're going to talk just a little bit about establishing your team, team's roles and responsibilities. Then Amy will talk quite a bit about describing quality improvement, uh, the difference between data collection and data analysis. And then she will do a little bit more of a deep dive into the model for improvement and improvement science. Uh, finally, we'll wrap up with uh, some discussion around specific diabetes measures. We'll watch a really quick video, and then we'll talk about a diabetes case study with a poll in it. So uh, with no further ado, next slide. Okay, so making your team work for QI. So really, we at PCBC, we stress establishing a project team. Uh, and next slide. And what we like to do is we really like to, uh, you can click through all the, there we go. Um, so we, we really like to make sure that we have a good cross section of your team and that you are including people that are all relevant to the various processes that are affected by whatever the work may be. So, so for uh, work related to diabetes, you might want to make sure you definitely have representation across your clinical team, but think about who else might be involved. Make sure you have an MA. Uh, make sure you're including certainly any uh, diabetes specialty care uh, uh, providers as well as possibly a scheduler, you know, the front desk. A lot of times there's different, different people involved in a, in a workflow, and we want to make sure that they're all represented there. So when a team is formed with the purpose of engaging in QI work, it's an important to lay the foundation and establish expectations prior to initiating our project work. So, you know, first of all, create a sense of excitement and a sense of urgency around the project itself. Rally the team around the purpose. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it is helpful to create goals, particularly if there are multiple teams that will be working towards the same uh, initiative, make sure there's goals, maybe even some incentive. Ensure that everyone has the expectation of contributing to work. Establish roles and a team lead, and make sure that team lead is not necessarily the highest person on a totem pole. We, we really like to sort of rethink our hierarchical structure when we create smaller subset teams for our quality improvement work. This helps engage everybody and make sure that some of those people that aren't usually involved in QR work feel like they're involved and um, it, it sort of initiate, reinvigorates the work. Then establish a standard of high quality. This is really, really important. If we aren't producing high quality work, then it really isn't worth doing. And we sort of have to keep that, that quality high throughout the engagement, particularly if it, as it goes on longer. And then of course, we need to establish common values. Make sure that transparency, sharing, learning, and accountability for results are just baseline parts of the team. And a great idea is actually to create a team charter at the beginning of your work so that those values are incorporated into a charter and that you can go back and reference it every time you need to, or maybe even at the beginning of every team meeting as needed. All right, next slide. So there's a lot of different team roles that we can identify. We have a bit of a laundry list here, but really a team need a team member needs to be designated to facilitate the meeting. And so this would be uh, recording notes. And what we like to do is actually rotate who is the note taker over time. If it turns out that one person really enjoys taking notes, and certainly you can keep them doing it. But if not, make sure it's rotated so it doesn't feel like a chore. Uh, one team member needs to function as a uh, scribe or recorder. This may be the same person who's um, who's rotating, you know, the, the note taker. Another person needs to function as a timekeeper, really, really important. Uh, particularly if you're starting every meeting with an agenda, make sure somebody is sort of being a taskmaster and make, making sure you're moving on. And then finally, post your ground rules for conducting the work session. That goes back to our team charter, um, but you may wanna have just sort of a quick jotted down list of ground rules that you keep on a, on a blackboard next to you to reference or in the conference room. Okay, moving right along, uh, we will have Amy Goodman talk about quality improvement. Thanks, Maya. So let's take a look at some of the aspects of quality improvement to set the foundation for today's discussion. So data analytics and its role in healthcare. Let's talk about data analytics and how it is used in healthcare today. 
We use the information collected during patient encounters to drive how physicians and practices address patient outcomes. Over the last 10 years, improvements in care delivery have prompted the use of data collected in our electronic health records, or EHRs. Some of the examples of how patient encounter data include the tests and results ordered or obtained during the visit. For example, the hemoglobin A1C level, foot and eye exams, or even the urine dipstick. Using data is critical to your ability to quantify effectiveness and efficiency. Analytics often involves studying past historical data to research potential trends, to analyze the effects of certain decisions or events, or to evaluate the performance of a given tool or scenario. Sounds a lot like quality improvement, or does it? So how, do, how is data um, leveraged to improve outcomes? Some health plans have launched or are launching quality improvement initiatives based on claim submissions data. These initiatives include the monitoring and targeting for improvements in care delivery and or patient health outcomes. Improving quality and lowering cost are key, cost of care are key drivers in emerging payment policy and care coordination activities. So an example of quality improvement initiatives are um, from the Health uh, Resources and Service Administration, known as HRSA, they have a Diabetes Quality Improvement, QI initiative. This is to help patients control their diabetes. So diabetes poses a unique challenge for the HRSA Health Center program. For them, they've done the, the benchmarking and the research on their sites, and one of seven patients has diabetes, and nearly one in three of those has uncontrolled diabetes, which is equal to, uh, they define it as the hemoglobin A1C level is greater than 9%. And they also expect that these patients who have an uncontrolled uh, level for hemoglobin A1C or uncontrolled diabetes are more likely to experience health complications. So HRSA's Diabetes 2020 goals include increasing pediatric and adult weight screening by 5%, reducing new diabetes diagnoses by 5%, reducing by 5% patients with the hemoglobin A1C greater than 9%, and reducing by 1% the disparities gap between racial and ethnic groups with the highest and lowest rates of diabetes. Likewise, for certified community behavioral health centers of clinics or CCBHCs, four of their required measures include prevention and uh, care and screening for body mass index or BMI, and screening and follow-up, weight assessment for child and adolescents, and for the BMI again, and then diabetes screening for people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder who are using antipsychotic medications, and diabetes care for people with serious mental illness, their hemoglobin A1C that is poorly controlled. So quality improvement refers to activities aimed at improving performance and is an approach to the continuous study and improvement of the processes of providing services to meet the needs of the individual and others. So how can data be leveraged to improve outcomes? The example shown here talks about, on the left, starting there and going to the right, the data collection and reporting by putting data into structured data fields in the electronic health record allows for reporting to be more accurate. As we move to data submission, information is sent electronically and the practice's data is used to determine many things about the practice. Information related to claims data, patient population demographics, clinical testing data, just to name a few. And lastly, finding and scoring improvement opportunity. So let's look at data that is constantly being used to improve patient outcomes. This includes individual patient outcomes known as macro and population level or macro improvements. Good reporting should raise questions about the business from its end users and good analysis transforms data and information into insights and answers. An example of how one of the federally qualified health centers that we've worked with, or known as FQHCs, how they track their measures, they use something called, um, like they use something 
by the lines of data visualization to look at the different measures and be able to look across all the initiatives they participate in. So notice we have here at the top of the columns, the list, the column for the metrics. We have our uniform data system or UDS measures that they are required um, to report out on for HRSA. We have HEDIS measures that we'll get into briefly, as well as ACO and medical home measures. And in the middle, we have the diabetes measures that they have on their list. So let's take a closer look. For our UDS measures, these are a core system of information that are appropriate for reviewing the operation and performance of health centers. UDS reporting is a requirement for the for HRSA grantees, which are these FQHC clinics, including the community health centers, migrant health centers, health care for the homeless grantees, and public housing primary care grantees. So the data is used to improve health center performance and operation and to identify trends over time. The UDS data is compared with national data to review differences between U.S. population at large and those individuals and families who rely on the health care um, safety net for primary care. Some UDS examples include patient demographics, services provided, staffing, clinical indicators, utilization rates, cost, and revenues of the grantee health centers. So as we can see from this report, the UDS measure being tracked is on diabetes, the hemoglobin A1C greater than nine results or patients who were untested. So we've, they have it highlighted and in yellow and listed as tracked for that specific measure. For HEDIS, the next column over, the Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set, known as HEDIS, was developed by NCQA, the National Committee for Quality Assurance. So it's a comprehensive set of standardized performance measures designed to provide uh, purchasers and consumers with the information they need for reliable comparison of health plan performance. So the HEDIS measures relate to many significant public health issues such as cancer, heart disease, smoking, asthma, and diabetes. As we can see, the HEDIS measures that are being tracked include diabetes, hemoglobin A1C screening that it's being done, diabetes monitoring of people with diabetes and schizophrenia, and diabetes screening for people taking antipsychotic medications. The next column over is our ACO, Accountable Care Organization. So this practice has a contract with ACO, they're part of it, as um, an association of hospitals, healthcare providers, and insurers in which all part party vo parties voluntarily assume financial and medical responsibility for Medicare and Medicaid patients, depending on the type of ACO you're involved in. So as we can see for the ACO measures, they include tracking for the diabetes eye exam annually, diabetes hemoglobin A1C greater than nine results or patients who were untested, and tracking diabetes controlled patients who had a hemoglobin A1C list less than eight. Lastly, we have our PCMH or patient-centered medical home column because this practice also was uh, recognized as a patient-centered medical home. And as a medical home, they um, have a goal of lowering costs, just like an ACO, lowering costs and improving patient outcomes. But the PCMH or the medical home is an approach to care for an individual practice. Whereas the ACO, their method is of the reimbursing a network of providers. So for the purposes of the medical home, the practice is tracking the diabetes hemoglobin A1C controlled measure for, greater, for less than 8% um, for patients. So being part of a medical home requires practices to manage patient populations and perform quality improvement activities in an effort to improve patient health outcomes. Here is another way that we can see and visualize the data from this community health center or CHC. So this dashboard shows how they monitor monthly goals on their UDS metrics. You'll see the diabetes measure highlighted here in red. The goal the practice has set is 13.4%, which is lower than both the CDC and the New York State goal. But they are showing improvement as their rate of diabetes patients with the hemoglobin A1C greater than nine or untested is down by 6.3%. They also note some comments on their dashboard that the percentage is supposed to be low. Patients with diabetes with a hemoglobin A1C 
um, was above nine or untested because the goal is to lower that percentage rate. So remember, QI is a method for continuously finding ways to improve better patient care and services at its core. The QI is a team process like Maya talked about. Most QI initiatives benefit from having a team of individuals who are focused and accountable for clearly defined improvement aims. Let's dive in a little bit more about the model for improvement as it relates to quality improvement. So the model for improvement was developed by Associates in Process Improvement, known as API. It's a tool for accelerated improvement. This model is not meant to replace change models that organizations may already be using, but rather to accelerate improvement. So this model has been used very successfully by hundreds of healthcare organizations in many countries to improve many different healthcare processes and outcomes. So this model has two parts. At the right, you see the model for improvement. It has three fundamental questions which can be addressed in any order. The questions are, what are we trying to accomplish? So this aim statement is essential for starting us on our improvement journey. We will review this more in depth later. The second question, how will we know that a change is an improvement? We need to know what we will be measuring to see if a change implemented is an improvement or not. What change can we make that will result in improvement? So while all changes do not lead to improvement, all improvement requires change. A change concept is a general notion or approach to change that has been found to be useful in developing specific ideas for changes that lead to improvement. As you can see from the diagram, the questions inform what the PDSA cycle will test, and then the results of the PDSA cycle circle back around to the questions to determine what is still needed for improvement. The PDSA cycle is, represents plan, do, study, act, and this is an effort to test changes in real work settings. The PDSA cycle is the test of the change to determine if there is, um, if the change is an improvement. So we use our PDSA cycles to study and act on changes. The PDSA cycle guides us for that, uh, to test that change to determine if it's an improvement. So here we have, what is a PDSA? It's a tested method for action-oriented real-time learning and change. To test a change, you have to plan it, try it, observe the results, and act on what is learned in the next test. The key principle is test on a small scale initially, use rapid cycles, meaning short, brief cycles, and scale up in a short time frame. So what is a PDSA cycle? Let's start at plan on the top right. The plan uses an objective, questions and predictions as to why we're making the change in the first place, plan to carry out the cycle of who, what, where, when, and the plan for the data collection. Once we go through that, we go down to do on the lower right. This is where we carry out the plan document our problems and unexpected observations, and we begin an analysis of the data. So really what happened during our test of the change? Next, we move over to study, where we complete the analysis of the data. What do we learn compared to our prediction? We compare the data to the predictions and summarize what we learned. And then we move up to act. So what changes are to be made? What should we try next? Should we tweak it and try again? Are there other conditions we should consider testing? So when to use the PDSA? This is for trying changes to existing processes, trying new processes, trying new tools, trying new measures. A test or an observation is planned, including the plan for collecting that data. Learning questions are a part of that plan and predictions are made to, as a part of that plan as well. So the plan is attempted, that's when you're doing the plan. Time is set aside to analyze the data and study the results. And the action is rationally based on what we've learned. So understanding systems. W. Edward Deming said, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. We need to think in terms of results generated by systems within which we all work. 
Deming's teachings build on the theory of variation and the need to redesign or improve the system to narrow variation as the principal cause of error. For example, in 1999, the United States healthcare system was perfectly designed to achieve as many as 98,000 inpatient deaths per year due to errors. And in 2013, the US healthcare was perfectly designed to cost more per capita than healthcare in any other industrialized nation. So as you can see, the essential elements for system improvement is you have to have the will to improve, the ideas about alternatives to the status quo, and then you must commit to making the execution real. Let's talk about improvement science. Improvement science emphasizes innovation, rapid cycle testing, and spread in order to generate learning about what changes produce improvements. We are going to break down improvement into the five stages that are shown here by each different color. What is your system designed to do? Well, for our purposes, we're looking at setting aims, choosing our measures, developing changes, testing those changes, oops, and implementing the changes. So does your system have an aim? Does it utilize measures? Does it respond to the need to change? If it does, then your system applies to improvement science. So an aim statement. An aim statement should be time specific and measurable, stating exactly how good, by when, and for whom. An example of this is by December 1st, we will increase the percentage of diabetes patients screened for severity and control. And we will put in the specific uh, rate of the percentage of diabetes patients. We want to establish measures. So the feedback to know if a specific change actually leads to an improvement and quantitative measures can often provide the best feedback. Without this kind of information, we don't know if we've made a difference. We're going to look at three types of measures, outcome measures, process measures, and balancing measures. An example of these measures are the percentage of patients with controlled diabetes, the MCO quality scores, managed care organization quality scores, and the number of emergency department or ED visits related to diabetes. These measures that we've just shown you as examples happen to be outcome measures. Next, we're going to identify changes. How are you going to achieve your aim? And where do new ideas come from? Changes that you can think of are running registry lists, using electronic health record alerts, completing diabetes care plans, and so on. You develop a prediction that by using these change tactics, we'll be able to decrease the percentage of patients with diabetes who have a hemoglobin A1C greater than nine and lower the, the number of emergency department visits related to diabetes. Testing changes. This is where the PDSA cycle portion of the model for improvement comes in. By planning a test of change and trying the plan, observing the results and acting on what you learn, you will progressively move towards your aim. So this is something that we can discuss that can be done for diabe uh, patients with diabetes. What are we thinking to do for them as far as to test for changes? Are we doing a registry list and outreach, call them in to come for their hemoglobin A1C test? Things like that. It's important, um, that we wanna talk about the importance and effectiveness of these small rapid cycle tests to ensure that changes are tested and improvements are kept, while the activities that are not helpful are studied and then disregarded. So here we have implementing changes. Change that results in improvement. Logically, this has a next step to implement it, meaning make the change the new standard process in one defined setting. So an example of this would be initiating alerts in your electronic health records to promote diabetes um, hemoglobin A1C testing to remind staff that 
the patient is due for certain referrals um, for podiatry or ophthalmology during the patient visit. Implementing changes happen at one setting initially, and then the outcomes are able to be scaled across uh, the sites that are part of the system. And now we're going to Maya to talk about the diabetes measures. Great, thank you. All right, next slide. So we are actually gonna watch a very brief video. It's, it's not too long, and it really provides a great snapshot into the important importance of using improvement strategies and developing your QI skills through practice and repetition. So really using that, uh, our PDSA cycle that Amy just went through in order to really refine our work uh, over and over, quick, quick cycles. So with no further ado, go ahead. So why does everybody need to understand the basics of improvement? Well, essentially, we don't really know the answers to our biggest complex quality and safety issues today. Uh, and we need to really make sure that we involve everybody in helping us discover solutions to these problems. So everybody needs in their day-to-day -day practice a way to solve challenges and fix things without needing to ask permission. And the tools of improvement give you a way to do that. Seeing things through an improvement lens can help you to, instead of continuing to do those workarounds um, and create additional steps and additional waste, um, really think about how can I do this differently? What ideas can I try today to make this better for my own work? Improvement is a skill. Uh, it, it needs practice and refinement over time. Uh, it's all the softer stuff around improvement. So how do you influence and engage people? How do you really do this work in practice in the midst of a really busy environment where you're functioning uh, on a day-to-day -day or minute-to-minute -minute basis and yet thinking about how do you improve things for tomorrow? That's a skill and that needs lots and lots of practice to hone and refine. We're all experts in a certain content area. You might be a nurse or a doctor or a data technician, whatever it is. You have that content knowledge expertise. I think for for everyone, it's important to know a little bit of the science of improvement and incorporating that into your daily work because it can show up in the ways that you um, look at your data, the way that you think about data, the way that you see the process from a different perspective, um, like appreciating the system you're working in and thinking about how patients are moving through that system or whoever the customers are. We can bring that into our daily work and thinking about our own workflows and policies and patient engagement on a different level by having that desire to learn and improve in our, in our everyday. All right, I hope, I hope you guys found that uh, video helpful. I actually think it might be a great video that you could share with your teams as you're initiating a project. Just a, a good little reminder that we are all always improving and refining our own skills. And we, we always sort of have an extra ring on that ladder to, to go as we initiate some of this QI work. So here are some uh, measures that we mapped out that are specifically related to this work around diabetes and behavioral health. Um, so the outcome measures, this is fairly straightforward. Many of you should, are probably already focusing on some of these outcome measures. So looking at the percentage of patients with controlled uh, hemoglobin A1C, this is actually so common that you're probably submitting this data to a lot of different sources. Um, managed care organization quality scores, Amy mentioned that one, and the number of emergency department visits related to diabetes. Some related process measures would be the percentage of diabetes patients that have been screened for severity and control. Uh, the percentage of eligible patients referred to an endocrinologist, so it's always good to look at your referral rates. And then the percentage of providers making referrals, that, that's actually seems, the, it, looking at eligible patients versus those that we have actually referred. Another one I could add in there is follow-up, you know, for how many of those patients that we referred have we actually received a consult note from that uh, endocrinologist. So lots of different process measures here. And I would say when I work with practices, I feel like most of the time they're focused on the process measures. And it isn't because they don't care about the outcomes. It's just that it's often easier to control processes and to see improvement on processes than on outcomes, which is really sort of that next step. 
And then balancing measures. This can be a little bit hard for people that are really new to QI and to metrics in general uh, to understand, but oftentimes there are things that are affected by some of the work that we do, but that aren't, you know, exactly what we're, we're looking to improve. So just an example of one, screenings for other chronic disease control. So looking at uh, balancing priorities among patients with comorbid diseases with, with constraints of visit. So there's, they're really, interestingly, you know, for the better or worse, these patients that we would looking, be looking at for our outcome and process measures are probably suffering from other issues, and we want to make sure we're keeping those in check as well. All right, next slide. So what are we trying to accomplish here? Uh, there are tools that help us display what we are hoping to achieve. And one of these tools is a driver diagram. We're not going to go too extensively into this, but I do wanna talk a little bit about how to construct your own aim statement, as that is really sort of our jumping off point when we're doing any sort of uh, QI work. So our aim statement, what do we want to do? By when, for whom, and how much improvement are we looking for? A good aim statement is specific, it is measurable. Oh, you can go to the next slide. Just bounce back. Uh, it is measurable. That's very important. We want to make sure that we have something to measure, that it isn't just sort of broad and, and uh, open. It, it needs to be actionable and preferably something that's actionable by us. You know, I think uh, one of the ruts that we find is when we're looking at metrics that we want to improve that we don't have too much control over. For example, sometimes uh, primary care practices really struggle with getting improving their colonoscopy rates because they can't actually do a colonoscopy in-house. I'm not saying that we don't want to focus on that because we can do a better job looking at our referral system, making sure we're following up with patients, but we want to make sure that we're picking something that's actionable uh, and in the short and long term. Achievable. So what do we mean by that? We mean pick a goal that isn't 100%. So let's say our baseline metric is 65%. Let's say make our goal maybe 70% rather than jumping all the way to 100. Certainly, you know, we want to get all of our patients screened for their A1C, but we're not going to be able to be perfect right away and possibly ever. Uh, relevant. Certainly we want our aim to be relevant to our overall goal and, and the measure itself that we're looking to improve. And then time-based. It's nice to make short-term goals. So let's say we want to improve a measure by, we want to improve our A1C screening from 65% to 70%, maybe uh, by the end of September 2020. Uh, and sometimes goal practices actually even pick short-term goals. Let's say their, their goal is to improve it by that 5% by the end of, uh, by June 2021, and then they they pick a short-term goal in between there. So it's really nice to frame, give a time frame for your goal so that you can double check yourself and see if you're actually achieving what you hope you were. Next slide. So just an example of some possible aim statements. Uh, by March 2020, ABC Medical Group will improve care for adult patients with uncontrolled diabetes to ensure that 90% of diabetes patients are screened for severity and control. 75% of diabetes patients receive A1C screening every six months. 100% of providers refer eligible patients to the endocrinologist. And the average number of monthly emergency department visits for diabetes decreases from 10 to 2. That last one is a bit ambitious. But alas, these are all possible aim statements that we could focus on. And you can see that, that really they are all specific, measurable, actionable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Next slide. Okay, so now we're going to do a case example. Uh, I apologize, I am going to have to read out the case to you. Uh, you can read along with me. And then we are going to do a polling question. ABC Health Center has been looking at their population of patients diagnosed with both diabetes and schizophrenia. In addition to monitoring, they have decided to pay special attention to medication adherence for these patients. Currently, only 62% of their patients at the practice are consistently adhering to their medication. The health center forms a project team and discusses possible interventions to enhance monitoring and medication adherence. 
In addition to medical staff, the team would like to make sure behavioral health providers are discussing medication adherence with patients and communicating with medical providers accordingly. The focus of the intervention will be to discuss and flag patients with diabetes and schizophrenia during the morning team huddle. When available, the on-site social worker will be included. Additionally, the group will consider using the on-site community health worker to follow up with patients by telephone. So in this case, we have their baseline, 62%. We know that the main uh, purpose of their intervention is to increase, enhance the monitoring of medication adherence. And so the strategy of this group is to include the behavioral health providers who, though they aren't the ones prescribing, perhaps they are having conversations where it will become apparent whether or not the patient is adhering and why or why not. And so the strategy is to incorporate looking at this population into the morning huddle, making sure the huddle is including behavioral health providers as well as just the medical team, and then uh, possibly including on-site community health workers as they are available who may follow up with patients by telephone. Okay, next slide. So we did put together a little bit of a rationale for, for why we wanted to look at this measure. So the measure is selected, is used to assess the percentage of patients, 18 to 64. We did want to look at this entire population, and that's a fairly standard measure, so we wanted to be consistent with the age specification. We know that people with schizophrenia are at greater risk of metabolic syndrome due to their serious mental illness and may be less likely to, to um, adhere to their medication. Diabetes screening is important for everyone, uh, for anyone with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And then the added risk associated with antipsychotic medications contributes to the need to screen people with schizophrenia for diabetes. And then finally, diabetes screening for individuals with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder uh, who are prescribed an antipsychotic medication may lead to earlier identification and treatment of diabetes. So really, you know, time is money. We want to make sure that we are screening early so that we can treat early and prevent exacerbation of a disease. Next slide. Okay, this is the fun part. So please complete the poll. We will give you um, about 30 seconds to complete this one and then we'll talk about it. Okay, um, it appears that some people can't read it. So, oh, okay. Uh, sorry about that. So uh, these, this, I will just read the whole thing just so you know. So the question is best aim statement examples based on diabetes case provided. So the best one is by September 30th, 2020, increase medication adherence by 5%. Doesn't sound too complicated, uh, but it does fall within our, um, our, our smart specification for, for creating a good aim statement. Uh, I really like that we're only looking to increase by 5% as opposed to the one, uh, the other option we included, which was increasing by 20%. Honestly, it's just a bit too ambitious, particularly if we're doing it at within a three month period. Uh, we know that this one's time bound. We wanna do it by the end of September. And then um, it is a very specific goal, so not sort of looking, looking too far afield. Uh, we are making it as specific as possible. So thank you for all completing that. All right, next slide. All right, so this is a sample PDSA uh, for diabetes example, and it really goes through this review of gaps in care report during the team huddle. And so I just want to highlight a few parts of it. So in, this is, just so you know, we're looking at the, the me measure, the NQF measure 1932. This is an established measure. It's, it's used to assess the percentage of members 18 to 64 years of age with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder who were dispensed in antipsychotic medication and had a diabetes screening test. So that is the specification, the measure. I didn't set that. You can look that up. And so 
this is sort of various steps that you could take if you wanted to do this intervention. So on Tuesday afternoon, the PCA will run a gaps in care report because remember that is, that is important so that they can review it during the huddle the next day. Uh, patients with diagnosis of diabetes and schizophrenia will be identified, reviewed, and discussed as needed. On Wednesday morning, they wanted to make sure that the MD, uh, the, the medical assistant, the LPN, and the social worker, as well as a front desk clerk on, on the specific green team, uh, are included in the huddle at 8 a.m. The team will take steps to be addressed and make a plan for addressing them. And then for data collection, they will consider, did the meeting take place? Uh, if yes, how long was it? We want to. It's it's good to note how long it took, just so that we know whether or not it's uh, too long, perhaps, and being a real burden on our staff. Uh, what were the number of gaps in care identified, and how many were you were able to address when the patients actually came? Okay, so the do part of our PDSA uh, was the test test. We ran the test as planned. The huddle took 15 minutes. So this is some of the notes, you know, as you can see. Uh, there was a long line of patients waiting for the clerk after the huddle. So we know that we sort of bogged down the system a little bit. And so we have to consider possibly having our front desk clerk maybe leave the huddle a little bit earlier, or we could move up our huddle so that it's not impeding uh, that first rush of patients. Uh, we had three walk-in appointments that were scheduled that night before that weren't on the report. And then six patients had gaps to be addressed, three had gaps addressed once you know, they were actually realized. Okay, now study. So in the study por portions, this is where we're looking at results versus predictions. So the huddle took a little bit longer than expected. We were hoping it was only gonna take 10 minutes. Uh, only 50% of patient gaps were addressed. We'd hoped that 75% would be. We realized we really did need a better system for noting who has a gap and documenting the plan to be addressed. Two of the patients that were walk-ins also had gaps in care. So, you know, we are always going to have that trouble of accounting for patients that are walking in and not previously scheduled, but at least we will have a good handle on those who are scheduled and who have gaps, so we're ready for them when they get there. Uh, identifying patients with diabetes and schizophrenia did not take long and did seem productive, so that's a really good thing. Uh, but we did create a backlog for the front desk, so that's not as good. And then finally, so act, should we, should we repeat this? How did it go? Uh, so we decided to repeat the test and use a planning worksheet to assign responsibilities for making sure gaps are addressed. Uh, we did not include the front desk clerk because we did not want uh, a backlog at the front desk. The MA was assigned to scan charts of walk-in patients to review gaps and do uh, a little quick huddle with the, the doctor throughout the day to address them and include them. So overall, definitely a good study. As you can see, this was short. You know, this was sort of a one-day trial. I would even say try it for a few days, maybe a five-day period, and then come back and reassess. Uh, you don't really need to do a PDS, typical PDSA cycle. really isn't much longer than that. You want it to be quick so you can make some changes and try it again. Uh, keep on refining it. That's really the, that's the way to go. All right, next slide. So when it comes to that last part of the PDSA, the ACT portion, uh, we, there's really three main areas. We need to adapt. Uh, well, we either adapt, which means we're revising this change and trying it again. We're completing another cycle. We're adopting the change. This typically isn't, isn't something you do after your first cycle. It's usually after a few subsequent rounds. Uh, but you know, ultimately the, the hope is that we can adopt whatever change we've tested and scale it up. So bring it to other parts of your, your practice, uh, maybe other provider team groups or even other practices. You know, many of you are working for multi-site facilities. And then finally, abandon. And sometimes you do just have to abandon it. You know, sometimes it didn't work out and you're glad you tested it on a smaller scale rather than implemented it on a broader scale. So uh, don't, don't feel badly if, if sometimes you have to abandon because sometimes you do. All right, next slide. So learning from failed tests. Using PDSAs helps us learn as we go. So why doesn't work? What doesn't work and why not? Uh, maybe the change was not executed well. 
maybe uh, we needed to support processes that were inadequate and or we did support processes that were inadequate and really we needed to sort of relook at our whole system and, and rework it. Um, maybe our hypothesis or hunch was wrong. That's possible too. And that's actually happened to us, uh, particularly in some of the access work I've done. I, I find that sometimes people's uh, initial predictions as they're going into access work may be completely wrong once we actually look at some of the, the cold hard data that has never really been looked at before. Uh, so what happens when you know our hypothesis was wrong? Well, we need to change our execution but did not result in a local improvement. And we need to look at a place where we can make it a larger impact and, and really change that, that measure. All right, next slide. So what it takes to improve. Um, so you, we, need to, we need the will to change the current system. And this is where having a culture of change is really important. And having really strong, positive leadership buy-in can often make or break our quality improvement work. Uh, and I really can't undercount this. This is, uh, this is an area that we often find, particularly as we get involved and do sort of long-term quality improvement work with our practices, that if there isn't a really good culture around improvement and change, then sometimes these quality improvement projects end up looking very punitive and um, then there builds a great amount of frustration on the team. And so we have to sort of break down those barriers and make sure that it's very clear that we are not looking to penalize anybody or point fingers. We're really hoping to all take responsibility for our work and recognize that there are parts of our, our system, about our, our various workflows and processes at the practice that may need to change. And, it, and it's okay, you know, it's, it's not usually just one person that's doing something wrong. Uh, the ideas about changes that will improve the system, uh, we need to make sure that we have a theory that links changes to outcomes. And then finally, the execution of ideas, we need a way to distinguish successful from unsuccessful changes. And that's actually where we like to use the PDSA cycles because you're, you're looking at such a small portion of your workflow that it often doesn't feel as punitive and, and it is often very clear whether it was successful or not. And, um, you know, again, usually you're, you have some successes and some, you know, failures, so to speak, so then you can tweak them and, and retry along the way. And that's, that's where the improvement comes in. Next slide. Okay. Thank you, Maya. So just wanted to share with you the model for managing complex change. This is an excellent tool both to plan change as well as to diagnose issues when a project is already happening. It provides a consolidated map of all the elements needed and I particularly like the focus on incentives as they are way too often, they are way too often missed in many alternative models. So when one is missing we're going to look through each of these six elements that are required for effective change. When you have them all you have success. When you're missing urgency change is slow. So without the buy-in into change by the key stakeholders of the organization, you might end up with a situation where, um, where, where change can't happen. The next one with vision, when you're missing a vision for change, there's confusion. So that guiding force behind what you're trying to do, you will not end up with change. You'll end up with confusion because there won't be a guiding star during the change process. Uh, when you're missing skills for change, there's anxiety. If you leave out skills necessary, um, like communication, um, advocacy, anything like that, to affect uh, uh, the change you seek, you'll be left with anxiety among your team members. If you have people who are unprepared to do the work, it doesn't matter if they have a great vision or buy-in, they'll feel anxious to fail. When you're missing incentives for change, there's resistance. The types of things, rewards, recognition, celebration, that keep key community stakeholders engaged. You might have changed, but it will be slow and generally marked by a high degree of resistance because people will simply try to stick to the old ways of doing things. When you're missing resources for change, there's frustration. If you leave out the resources, money, people, time, equipment, you will end up with the frustration because you've got a plan and you know how to accomplish it, but you don't have the resources to get the job done. And lastly, when you're missing an action plan for change, it's like being on a treadmill. Without a plan, broken down into steps, that can take and accomplish in small bits, you'll end up with a situation that resembles a treadmill where you're running, but you are not moving ahead. 
So I think that this is a great way to um, look at uh, this whole situation and see where you are um, along the journey to see which of your areas, the six elements that maybe you would need to make some improvement on. These slides right now are just to give you an idea of what you will have as handouts in the, um, on the website. So after our call today, you'll be able to um, have your own AIM statement, the SMART goal handout, and a two-page model for improvement worksheet that helps guide you along the path of doing your plan for the PDSA, the carrying out or do, the study section and act. And lastly, our ramp planning worksheet handout, which will provide you a guide to how you would scale up your um, PDSA processes um, as to uh, implementing additional workflows so that they can be spread to other sites. So the key takeaways from today's webinar, we want to make sure that you're consistently training staff to document properly. This will assure you that your organization meets its strategic and operational goals. And when you document properly, and data is recorded accurately in a way that is easily reportable, then that data helps the organization to be more strategic. By participating in QI reporting and having identified staff perform data analytics ensures that the practice will prioritize efforts, monitor results, and plan for the future. So your QI activities with your identified team members and monitoring that data helps the organization going forward. Lastly, utilizing dashboards to share data and highlight areas of concern is a way for all team members within a practice to discuss lessons learned. And this data visualization is essential for tracking measures and aligning your measures across various initiatives and keeping team members involved in the process. I just wanna say thank you and Questions, anyone? Uh, thanks, Amy, and thanks, Maya. So we have a few questions coming in, and uh, we have a few minutes, so we'll take a, go ahead and answer them. And also, just so folks know, uh, our next session that's already uh, should be on your calendars, there's almost like a part two of this. We'll be talking about actually implementing some of these things and what that looks like. Uh, so one of the things that came up in a few different ways, and I think this is common, is that particularly for um, behavioral health clinicians, um, it can be a little bit murky. Like, where do I sort of sit in the, in the QI process? Um, you know, how do I sort of demonstrate the value of, you know, what I'm doing around diabetes? Is it, you know, perhaps it's not like I'm not doing the actual, uh, you know, A1C testing or administration. Like, can you talk a little bit about kind of how those of us who are behavioral health folks kind of find our role in this? Sure, I'm happy to take that question. So when you are talking about where are you in this QI process, it depends on your role as part of the team. Where do you fit in with um, communicating um, with the provider, having access to the electronic health record with the, um, the patient's history related to their diabetes? Uh, this could also mean if you're someone who's um, not working at a health center, if you're working in a community health center and you do have an ability to communicate with providers for treatment coordination, then you are for sure part of the team. You just might not be there on a day-to-day -day basis with the, the other team members, but you are when you work with the patient, able to convey the same consistent messaging as far as um, maybe helping them to understand why the medication is prescribed or having a conversation related to how patients are coping with their diagnosis because oftentimes patients who are diagnosed with diabetes, it's a life-changing event. There are other complications related to depression and anxiety that help um, contribute to lack of adherence for medication and overall um, lack of insight related to their self-management of their situation. So having a behavioral health clinician involved um, with the QI process, I think um, having yourself as a resource for whoever is planning, scheduling the QI workflow and what the plan will be um, is essential in helping to um, navigate that. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I think this is a great point, right? Like we've encouraged all throughout the series, uh, you know, behavioral health uh, providers can, can sort of should be looking at similar metrics as their medical counterparts and really taking taking kind of a shared role in that. But it takes some creativity and it's not always how we were all trained uh, to do this. But uh, for folks who are um, kind of new to this uh, in our first uh, 
uh, session of the series, which is available on both the PCDC and National Council websites. We talk a bit about what specifically what does the behavioral health provider do. Um, in our last uh, minute here, uh, just a great comment here that came in from Ava. When I worked in an outside clinic, we had to do a complete overhaul of the patient check-in and registration. It didn't go as smoothly as it could have because we didn't, uh, the medical uh, receptionists were not asked for their input. Uh, any comments on that? Is that similar to what you've seen? Yeah, I mean, that's why we, we always include a brief section around team and establishing your team and who should be included in that team because, you know, we find it time and time again is that you end up having uh, parts of your team are not just those in the immediate medical care team. It ends up being a lot broader. And so, you know, what we often do is include somebody from honestly, each part of your of your health center uh, in order to just make sure, I mean, maybe that person isn't going to do a lot of contributing, but at least they're hearing it and bringing it back to, to their, um, their fellow colleagues. Uh, so, you know, I mean, all I can say is try and set those, those really good, solid, uh, they um, team charters and relationships from the beginning, uh, your expectations, your goals, and it sometimes it feels it's overlooked, it feels redundant, it's not. And it's something that you can keep going back and referencing as your quality improvement work expands and grows. Great. Okay, well, we are uh, at the end of our time here. Again, just a reminder, on June 29th, we have our, our second part of kind of related to our QI and, and using data series. Uh, so join us there and we'll continue this conversation. Uh, you can keep in touch with Amy at agoodman at pcdc.org, with Maya at mmorse at pcdc.org, and myself, a philip at pcdc.org. You have our emails through the calendar invite. Uh, you have access to our website, and we'll plan to see you for the remaining two parts of our series here. And also be sure to check out the SAMHSA Center of Excellence for Integrated Health Solutions for a host of additional resources related to integrating primary care and behavioral health. So thanks again, Amy. Thank you, Maya. Uh, thanks, Haim, for our, uh, coordinating and managing our work here. And thank you to the center and everyone for joining us today. Uh, we'll see you uh, next time. Thank you. Thank you.